This meeting. Perfect. That is exactly what I want to hear. Three and now being recorded. Everyone, I'm making you famous today. Congrats. We're going to do another fun lecture on some JavaScript. Yes, like I said already before the recording, objects and math objects are two things we're going to be covering today, or maybe one thing. Technically, I don't actually know if this one thing or two things. I guess we'll find out. And honestly, getittogether.com. I don't even know where this meme came from, but I was just like looking at it. like, how can we talk about grouping things together? It's like, I just love her sats. I was like, you know what? She's my memer. She's my gift for this one. Heck yeah. I think someone told me, is it like, Warren? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not even going to guess. Someone told me one time where she was from. I completely forgot. All right. Let's hop into what we always do every single time. Hashtag announcements. First things first is hashtag number two, assignment number two. I know we just finished up with assignment one. We celebrated last class. Congratulations. We have made it past that and we are on to assignment number two. Now it's time to start worrying about assignment number two. The due date for this one is going to be the seventh. The one extra happy thing about this is that this is not going to be a drop assignment. Unlike number one, number two is that you need to get it done by the due date, but there's a lot more leniency behind it. Does this give us the expectation that we can just leave this for after the due date? Not at all. Get this thing done. The worst thing you can do is that accept that the due date is later or whatever, excuse me, sorry, you can turn in the assignment later, but if these assignments pile up on you, getting it done by that next drop date can literally be impossible. And I've seen students, unfortunately, have to drop out due to it. Do not fall behind. Read assignment number two, at least know what it's asking, because after this class, you will have all the necessary tools to complete this assignment. So on the 7th of February, that is when that is when this next thing is due. All right, on to the next one. Studio review at eight, as always. Sorry, I'm looking at myself like, all right, am I glitching out? Just a lot, as always, small little note. Let me know if I'm going to glitch out. But to review at 8 p.m., feel free to join in on the fun. As always, it's recorded. You will definitely have access to it later. Thank you for the call out from one of your colleagues uh, for letting me know if the movie or some of the movies, if the lectures don't get uploaded to the channel, just throw a direct message at me. If it's not there by noon of the next day, that is my fault. Every morning I wake up and I try to throw it on there as soon as I am sipping my first cup of coffee. How many times can I throw coffee in this lecture? I don't know. We'll find out. But let me know if it's not there by 12 because I will throw it on there as soon as possible. That is my B. But usually I have those things at least scheduled to be um, released before noon the next day. All right. Now time for a personal note. I am off. Like I said last lecture, I am off the grid throwing the phone in the trash can, gone into the wilderness until Tuesday. Sometimes I just need to go away from 18 different screens looking at me all the time, and this is one of those weekends. So I will be off the grid until Tuesday. Of course, I am a millennial, so I will always have my phone attached to my hip, so I will get Slack messages. However, I might not be able to respond to them because I'll be out of self-service. If I do see anything that is an emergency, I will definitely reply back, but as always, feel free to reach out to your TAs or clerk if you need anything. But just letting you all know that if I'm not replying, it's not because I hate you. It's just because I love the wilderness. So that is that one. And then finally, because it's Tuesday, if you did the math, who's going to be here on Monday? Well, if you are paying attention to the last announcements, we're going to have a guest lecture on Monday. Bree will be stepping in and teaching us about modules. So she'll be taking over class here. And Bree, are you on the call right now if you want to say hi? Bree might not be here just right now but brie if she can't say hi right now you will all meet her on monday so just letting you all know all right any questions at all here will it still be the same link though oh for the for the recording uh no for the class on monday oh yeah yeah it'll still be the same link everything stays the same yep just come in the lecture like you always have and you'll just see a different person in front of your screen yelling at you question there all right any other questions here <laughs> i'm gonna take that silence quiet cough as a no all right let's keep going then awesome all right so everyone as you already know it is lecture number seven you have gone through seven classes with me you have done a lot of studios you have done the assignment one you have crossed that line past that very difficult one that uses all of those terms and all of those concepts we have learned so far. To get to this point where you are sitting right now, standing in front of your screen, however you are in front of the screen, listening to me right now, you have done a ton of work to be here. 
Right now, what you are doing is learning a brand new skill. Think about any skill you've learned in the past. You are learning a brand new one. This one right here is for coding. It comes with a lot of challenges, as you've seen. Everyone in this class learns skills in different manners, at different speeds, in different ways. Hence why we always give the feedback surveys, so you give us feedback of how to better approach learning for you. That being said, we learn at different speeds. If you ever feel that you are falling behind, know that you're not alone. There are many students here that are always feel the burden of this programming or are just learning this development language in general. You'll see people who are ahead of you. Don't let that deter you either. People will learn at different speeds. People came into this class at different places. People have different backgrounds. We know this, but in the end, remember, we are all learning this skill together. We will always be learning this skill together and you will not always be equal with everyone in the class because everyone is in their different spot when we are learning this brand new thing. So why am I saying this? When you do feel that pressure, because we will all feel it throughout this class, whether it be right now or down the line, that pressure will be there because you're not feeling the burden of a new programming language. You're feeling basically the burden of expanding your mind into this new thing that we are trying to conquer. You're feeling those growing pains as we learn through this language. So know if you ever, ever feel that you cannot get to this point, cannot learn this skill, know that you're lying to yourself. One, I was able to learn this, so you will be able to learn this. Two, you are better than what you think you are if, you ever, if that ever crosses your mind. Because you are here. You're here at lecture number seven. You're here for a reason, whether it's to better yourself, better your career, better your family, or just try to understand something new. So every day when you come into this lecture, remember that. And the second you start doubting yourself, reach out to me, reach out to your colleagues, reach out to your TAs, so we can tell you you're lying to yourself, you're meant to be here, and we're gonna learn some dang coding. Now, oh, awesome, let's get started. Help me out here. We're going to do what we always do. We're going to guess what Kyle programmed in these slides and help me out by placing in some code here. We're gonna guess the output for this code. Remember, you're the human compiler here. What is gonna be the output for this little bit of code? Meow. Meow. Anybody else got a guess? Meow. No. I, just, I just want to hear a bunch of people meow. meowing right now. That's my favorite thing. Meow. Absolutely right. Meow. meow. That's all right. <laughs> Our output is meow. Very good. All right, let's step it up a notch. Yeah. What if we have this? Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, how about our output right here? We're changing up a little bit. We added a conditional into here. What's our output now? Nine to one. Nine to one. Nine to one. Ten. Take a very close look. Zero. 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 A zero and then one. Remember, we go line by line. If you ever second guess yourself, go line by line. Break it down. Take that time. Break, yeah. The, the zero, for yeah. loop is going to say let zero. I equal it's a zero. Number I less from, a. It's a number from like zero, zero to ten. It lists zero. zero. It's it's gonna, gonna, I is equal to one. It'll just it'll just console log zero, zero and then it'll it'll break. Well, I think all right. Look, all right. It'll let's take do a, zero and I equal to one, one then That's it's gonna be think. break. So all right, all right, all right. I'm getting a lot of answers here. So I love it, I love it. Let's go ahead and talk about it real quick for this example. We go line by line, let cat name equal nacho. Cat name equals nacho. We go down to the for loop, let i equal zero. That's our starting spot. i is less than 10, zero is less than 10. We go ahead and go through it. Console log dot i, it's gonna console log zero. It's gonna go down the conditional next. If i equals 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 one, does zero, zero equal one? No. So we skip that if statement, we go down to that ending bracket and we hop back up to the for loop. Ask yourself what happens next. I is incremented again. I is now one. I is still less than 10, so we loop again. What happens next? We console log I, which at this case is one. So now we have two outputs, zero and one. Then we go to our conditional, I equal 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 one. Does I equal one? Yes, so we break. Remember break means exit the for loop. 
So we get out of there. So the ending result for this example is zero and one. That is our output. So remember, we go sequentially. Always go sequentially. So very good. All right, that was a fun one there. Any questions on this? Sorry, Big Brother has allowed you all to unmute yourself again. So feel free to yell any questions you have. Oh, and let me actually hop in the lecture questions. That's what I was missing. Oh, and I'm missing another thing. Oh my gosh, Kyle, what are you doing today? I'm sorry. There we go. And awesome. All right, so no questions on that. Let's hop into another one then. What's our output gonna be here? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Very good. Nothing. Why is it nothing? A return statement. We haven't called we didn't call function inside no. of the parameter. We're not calling the function. function was not call Very good. We didn't call the function. Remember, functions require two things. We need to create the function, which is exactly what we did here. But in order for it to run, we need to call it. We need to actually say meow, open and close parentheses. So remember, no, we won't have an output here because we didn't call it. We didn't do the second thing a function wants. So very good. All right, let's keep going. Will this work? No. No. Very good. I just love it. It's like, no, no, not at all. Like disgusted. Disgusted. I would even type that. Absolutely right. That would not work because you can only assign one variable at a time. I put this in this because I have seen past students do this. So I just wanna let everyone know, we cannot do a double assignment here. You will get that error. All right, fantastic. Everybody. That was being pretty possum today. Right, it sounds like possum. I mean, possum, I don't know, whatever. It sounds like that. Awesome job, everyone. All right, let's keep on going. As you know, today's theme is our feline friends, the cats. So that is what we're going to be working with today. So let's walk, work with Nacho, because if I had a cat, which I have to act more like a dog if I ever got a cat, his name would totally be Nacho. Love Nachos. All right, anyway, we have our cat named Nacho. We have our cat age of seven. Cool. So look at what we're doing here. We're just building some cat variables here. We've got a cat name, cat age. Let's give it some toys here. So for some reason, cats, this Nacho loves a mouse. It's not a real mouse and a feather. Cats love feathers. And then finally, Nacho is a good cat. So we got a little Boolean here. Remember our true and falses are always Booleans. So we got a good cat equal true. All right. Now let's say we bring in another kind of cat. Got a little tiger here. What we're gonna have to do, if we want to define about this tiger here, well, we have a whole new kind of cat in our code. So what we gotta do is add all of these other variables here to contain more information about our tiger friend here. That's cool, that's whatever. But what if we have another little one? What if we have like a nice little kitty cat that we found that we want to adopt or whatever? Well, we have to add more code to contain all that information about our third cat. Now, just take a look at your screen. We have 12 variables here just to contain information about three cats. Now, what if you just went cat crazy and you wanted to get 26 cats? I'm not gonna judge, but you still have a lot of variables to take care of. That's gonna get insane both with prices because that's going to be a lot of food and also with variables and information and data and just kind of trying to organize everything in your application. So this is a bit much to keep track of. So if we look at this, we have, like we said, three sets of four in, like bits of information about each of these cats. Wouldn't it be easier if somehow we could maybe take this information about our one cat, Nacho here, and box it up? contain it in something. Now we can talk about it, like what do we have to actually contain stuff right now? Well, the only data container we've truly talked about is an array, it's the only thing we have. But arrays, that's gonna be hard to like just put Nacho and then seven and then another array and then a Boolean in there. We have no idea what the context is. So we need to discover something else that we can maybe take those variables and place them into a box so we can actually contain this information in something usable. Now, this is what we need to explore today. What can we do to keep all of our information relevant to one thing, but also keep it all separated so we can utilize it? That's where the thing we're gonna be talking today about called objects is or comes from. Objects are a way that we can, or a tool we can use 
to contain information in a certain context or about a certain thing. Okay, in this case, Nacho, our friend there. So let's go ahead and actually see what this even looks like. Had a brain fart there. So we want to start creating an object. So what I'm gonna be doing here, and we haven't talked about this too much, so don't worry about it just yet, but we're gonna say let cat1 equal and then curly brackets. And then I'm gonna throw some information in there. Just remember in the curly brackets, like the if statements, the for loops, our functions, it contains information inside of there, all in different ways, but still shows that we're containing information. So that's how we're gonna start writing our object. We're gonna contain things in those curly brackets. And we're gonna start bringing down that information. So I'm gonna say cat name equals nacho, which is absolutely fine. But in the way, this is how we did it with a variable, we did equal sign, but objects to take what we did here and actually change it to something that objects would want, we trade out that equal sign for a colon. Right there. So inside of our objects, we did something very, very small. We took like what we did was created that variable. Instead of the using the equal sign in object, we use a colon. Then after the colon, we want have a bunch more information up there in that box. We have the cat age, fave toys, good cat, blah, blah, blah. We need to separate this with the thing JavaScript loves to separate things the most with commas. So we place a comma there, and then we're able to add more information into this object thing. So let's go and do cat age. Come down here. And what do we replace that equal sign with again? Colon. Comma. Very good. We place it with a colon. Equal signs or are replaced colon. with a colon. So that's how we say, hey, cat name should be seven there. And then we separate it with a comma. This right here is an object. The beginning creation of an object. So before we go even any further, let's go ahead and dive into exactly what we're even looking at. As I already mentioned, to start building an object, we need to utilize the curly brackets. This denotes the creation of an object. And inside of here, we place all of the information we need to include inside of that object that belongs to our cat, that belongs to the thing that we're trying to create. So inside of those curly brackets, that's what we did in our last example. We placed Nacho and Seven, the cat age and the cat name in there. Now let's take a close look at this. We did some extra things to save information inside of this object. First of all, this thing here, you've heard of before. This is called a property. We've seen properties be used before. Remember, array.length. Length is a property. This is just another type of property, but instead of length, you're getting a cat name, something even better than length. But let's dive a little bit deeper into it. On the left-hand side, we have cat name. This is called the property name. It's very important. Not only is it very, very important, but it also has to be just like your variables in your application, unique, unique to the object. Your property name must be unique to the object. So we have the name of the property of what we're saving the information under. Let's talk about the actual information itself. We're gonna call this the property value. So we have the name, just like our variables have a name, but inside those variables, we have information, AKA values. It's exactly what this property value is. It gets saved inside of that property name. And then finally, the biggest thing to note here is that these are separated by a colon, by a colon. And then finally, at the very end, we have a comma saying we wanna add more information to this object. So we have to separate it by commas. And just like that, we have ourselves an object. Let's go ahead and see this thing in action. Now, if we said our cat name was Nacho, Nacho cat, <laughs> get it. Cat age is seven. Help me build an object here called cat one. What do we start with? Let cat one. Let cat one. So this right here is the variable name what we're gonna store the whole object inside of. Very good, yes, let cat one equal. And then what do we do? Exactly right, to start denoting the creation. Very good, to start denoting the creation of the object. Absolutely right, so curly brackets there. Awesome, awesome. And then let's go ahead and add cat name first. How are we doing? Cat name. Colin. Colin, very good, absolutely right. 
Quotes. Quotes. Quotes, because it's a string. Awesome. Nacho. Nacho Kama. cat. Very Kama. good. Comma. So we want to add cat Kama. age now. So comma at the very end. Very good. And then I'll do the last one here. Cat age. Age. And we said colon. And we said seven. Number so it was seven. seven. Right, seven. All right. Awesome job, everyone. We just created our first object together. Now take a close look here. On the left hand side, we always have the names there. That's completely fine. But look on the right hand side too. We have different data types on each one. So we have Nacho, seven. So it's really telling us, it's really hinting that we can maybe have a lot of data types inside of this thing, which is really useful. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about objects. What exactly are they? So what exactly are objects? Objects are things. They are representations of things. Cats are objects. A computer is an object. You are an object. You have properties assigned to you. Your eye color, your height, your age, things like that are all properties about you as the object. So anything in JavaScript or lots of programming languages out there, including maybe in Unit 2 with Java, everything is about objects, collections of information that make something relevant. And objects are the way we can construct that. Think about all the information in the world, how it's related. Those relationships build objects themselves. You, again, yourself, your eye color, your age, your height are all defining properties of yourself. They are building you as an object to really define you as something. So that's what objects are, is a way to collect information that is relevant to one thing together. Awesome, so what we can think about it is as a container that houses closely related things. Awesome, so I'm gonna pause here. Any questions about what we've covered so far? Will it throw an error if there is a comma after the last um, item like in right there? Mm -hmm. It will not. Nope, JavaScript's like, all good. Care. We're good with that. Yep. Great question. But just like we don't have a comma at the end of um, the values the in the one. error, we don't need a comma here, right? We don't need a comma. Oh, yeah, here. you don't need one. I just wondered if you get in the habit of always putting a comma at the end. Is that oh, going to okay. cause a problem if you? No, just like the semicolon, if you want to get yeah. in the habit, I actually do that myself. Just throw a comma in the end if you, if you wanted to. Yeah. All good. I want to actually see what the error is if we don't put a comma here. Yeah, there it is. Syntax error, unexpected identifier. So if you see that, also we'll get a red squiggly under here too. Does cool. it have to be formatted this way? Or is that just for our visual sake? It is recommended to construct it like this. As I've mentioned in the studios, you'll always see me place the curly brackets with a tab right after it. This is to help denote where the starting and ending of the curly brackets are, and also the true construction of the object. Yeah, you know, I was simple... just curious. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, you're absolutely right. I just, you know, I just wanna, I wanna go on my rant about it. But yeah, no, you can always put it in one line, but this kind of structure right here is recommended. But great, qu great questions, Christopher. No, um, yeah, this one is not for visual sake. This is truly the recommended uh, structure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? All right, we're doing great so far. Let's keep going then. Now we have our cat name and cat age in here. That's great. But we had a few more things in our example that we kind of want to bring in. Let's take a look at this next one. Cat's favorite toys. Now who can tell me out there, because I don't have you all muted yet, because I still want some conversation. What kind of data type is this? An array. It's an array. Also considered as our another data container in there. Now let's go ahead, we're gonna take this array and we're gonna be adding it to our cat object. Can we do that? Well, let's, let's find out, let's go crazy. First things first, we need to add a comma. Remember, always add that comma. As we just saw, we're gonna get that error if we don't. Next, we actually need to include the property name. So in this case, it's cat favorite toys. And then how are we gonna include this array? Exactly how it's up there. Include the array just as it's written. So square bracket, mouse, feather, close square bracket. This right here is how we include an array in there, nothing different. 
just another data type going in there. Then finally, or actually let's go over in here and add our thing in here. So I place a comma, cat fave toys. We said mouse and feather. Oops. And we see we only get any errors. We're good to go. Let's keep going. Hannah, I think I, I heard a question. I do. I have a question oh. about do we yeah, have Joyce. to do we have to um do like a um variable statement or at the beginning of like cat name, cat age outside of like let cat one equal I don't I, nope. I think I'm confusing. So yeah. the you don't have to define those variables ahead of the object? Nope, because you're defining them right here. Okay. Yep, this okay. is defining a property inside of an object. Okay. So okay. I, I am yeah. curious, can you call like like a console log to define any properties inside of an object? So if you do console log cat name, is it gonna, is it gonna be able to look inside of that object and pull it out? It's a great question. Well, you don't have any idea how to call things yet. So hold on to that question and we'll get there, I promise. We're just still at construction, but yes, I love that. If you asked what type of um, a cat name is, what would it come out as? Well, cat name's value is what? Uh, cat name's value is what? I'm sorry, maybe I don't think I heard it. Not sure. Not sure. Spring. It's a string. Yeah, yeah, data type is string. So the type of for the cat name, we, again, we don't know how to call it yet, so we can't really double check this, but the data type of cat name right now is string. So those Do you have to capitalize um, the strings or is that like best practice? Because I saw that in the exercises too. Oh, I mean, it's just the name of the cat. So no, you don't well, have to. Well, I mean like, but for mouse and feather, like it seems like everything that's inside is capitalized. No, that's just my, like my English teacher from fifth grade in the back of my head just yelling at me to capitalize my uh, nouns. So uh, no, no, you don't have to. Whatever's in the string is up to you as a developer. Is that your English teacher? It, your, your, is that your English teacher or your German teacher telling you to capitalize nouns in general? I never I took German. Thing. I wish it was. No, it is the English teacher. They always capitalize the things if it's the beginning of sentences. I don't know. Could be a bunch of teachers yelling at me. I got yelled at a lot. You don't even do oh. that anymore in German. Oh, really? I know yeah. I mean, I I'm sure old people do. <laughs> All right. Let's keep going here. So we have the cat favorite toys. No, they don't have to be capitalized. So no, that was just it. Uh, whatever is inside those quotes is completely up to you. So that was just luck of the draw of the examples. I will put it back there just for my own sake. <sighs> All right. Awesome. Let's keep going on here then. Last thing here, we have good cat equals true. This is a Boolean. All we do is we bring down good cat colon true. Nothing different. We always have to include that comma at the very end. We have our good cat in there. Cool. Come over here. I'm going to update our object just in replit for us. Good cat. Nacho, you are a good cat. And we just say true. Look at that. It lights up blue too. So look at how many different data types we have in here. Neat. Neat, neat, neat. Just all right, any final questions before this before we keep going on? I do, I have a question. So I, yeah, what's up? I just asked about the cat name. And so like, are all of them considered strings? Because like, I know cat age is a number and the true is a Boolean, but like if you were to type of, are they all considered strings? Take a look at cat age. How do we need to know what a string is? What characters do we use on the beginning the and end? Quotes. The double quotes. Right. So looking at cat age, what kind of data type would this be? A number. A number. Okay. So cat age is a string. A cat age is a number. Cat favorite toys. What kind of data type would that be? Strings. Array. 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 Inside of the array, if we ask with like at index zero, index one, that's a string. Okay. But what wraps it is an array. Okay. I didn't know if like they were all like under the same thing since they were all part of an object or if they were all still individual as they are. So that answered that. Yeah, absolutely. They're all part of the same context, the same object, but they hold their individuality. So they'll still keep their own data type. I have a question. Um, yeah. Does every um, property name have to have a value? 
or can there be a, or does there, I mean, would you put in undefined if you needed a placeholder? Say you don't know if it's a good cat, but you have that category for all of your cats. Absolutely. So, if you don't know if it's a good cat just yet, you can place something that's not assigned technically. But remember, mm -hmm. in JavaScript, nothingness is still something to us. Right. You're absolutely right, Amy. You put in undefined. Okay. I'm feeling my database background coming at me. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, but we will not do this. You cannot just place good cat here and then comma. It needs to have some kind okay. of value, whether that is true, 118 yes, or undefined, it has to have something there. Okay. Is, an array, that true? is an array the only way to assign multiple values to a key? Well, a data container is an array, we can have multiple values there, but what's another data container we learned about today? Object. Object. Objects, absolutely right. So can objects go inside of objects? What? I don't even know what an object inside of an object would be. Heart. Cat heart. Are this going inside an array? There we go. <laughs> so another way, so not only arrays can we show multiple values, but we can put arrays in, or we can put objects inside of objects. So Jacob, to answer your question, not only arrays to show multiple values, but you could also just use another object to include more information inside of that object. Does that kind of help out? Yeah. And to like access that value, would you just do like cat one dot cat heart dot whatever the key is? I don't know. Let's go ahead and explore that. I love the transition piece. Let's see how we can actually get some stuff. First, I want to really call out one thing about this object that we just created. I like cats. I mean, I love dogs more, but we like cats, but there's a lot of cat going on in this object here. This is fine when we are doing variables because variables have to be very specific to what we're using them for. But instead of objects, we shouldn't be that redundant. We can eliminate a lot of this because we know inside of this object, we're talking about a cat. Remember, we're talking about the context of whatever's inside this object. We have a lot of cat information. So we know we're talking about a cat name. We know we're talking about a cat age. So re remove cat from there. We know we're talking about that. So instead we can simplify our property names to down to this and still be okay. So name, age, fave toys is good. So when we're coming up with our property names, which is a very important thing, Remember, you don't always have to include what it's about. You can make it more simplistic because we know what object we're in. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do right now. I'm just going to go and edit this stuff. Age. And is good. You'll see is starting out a lot of booleans because that's just typical. It can either be has or is. So is kind of denotes that like, oh, this is going to be a boolean. So is good. It's kind of like asking a question, is this cat good? Hence the bull. All right, there we go. Awesome. So let's keep going in here. I'm hearing a lot of questions about a certain way we do some things. So let's go ahead and start talking to our cat. Yes, we're going Dr. Doolittle right now. We're gonna ask our cat, hey, what's your age, kitty cat? We need a, some way to ask our cat this question and get the information back. So when that happens, we need to call for information inside of our cat, inside of Nacho. So what we do is we first talk about what object we're going to be reaching into. Look on the right-hand side, or yeah, look on the right-hand side. I'm always 50-50 on my lefts and rights. Look on your right-hand side. Our variable name is cat1. So just like if we were ever calling to a variable of any other kind of type, we need to start with the name that we are referring to. So we start with cat1. Next, we need to ask this cat1, Nacho, for the information inside of it. With that, we use dot notation. And we ask for the information that we want. We are asking for its age. So we say dot age. This right here is how we can do that. Taking a closer look at it, remember, cat1 is the variable that holds the object, with all the information inside of it. And then over here, we ask it using the property name. Again, you've seen this before in your arrays. When you say array.length, you were asking for a property inside of that array. This is nothing new. We're just using things that now we've built instead of things that JavaScript provides. So something that provides more custom, 
customization on our end, which is great. We can actually now create dogs. You can create cats. We can create whatever we want. And this is how we get the properties out of them. So awesome. Let's go ahead and do one more here. So we do cat one. Ooh, excuse me. Sorry. Let me go over here and actually do this. So let's go ahead and actually see this in action. So we said we want to call out information. First things first, let's go ahead and do a console log because we're actually going to see the information on the right hand side. It's the only reason why I'm using console log. Now, help me get the name of the cat. Who can tell me this one? How do we get one. the name of the cat? Cat one. Cat, cat. one. Dot, cat one. Awesome. Dot, dot, we dot, use dot notation. Very good. Or, we are name. in this case, we we're trying to get the name of the cat. Name. 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 So we say name. Very good. Yes, cat.name. Let's go and run this and see what happens. Get back knob show. Awesome. Now, what if I want to get age? We just do cat age. that age. Awesome. And then finally, one more thing, which I think I'm skipping ahead of my lecture. Let me look at my slides here. Yeah. No, we're going to do it. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to go ahead and see if this cat's heart is still on kicking. So the question was, how do we do this? If it is an object within an object, we gotta still keep asking for the information. We're asking, hey, cat one, give us your heart. And then after that, we say, okay. give us the information inside of the heart. We say, dot is yeah. still mm -hmm. kicking. Keen. And we run this and we say we get back true. So cycling back to your question, Jacob, does this help answer that? I believe yes. this was your question. Okay, awesome, awesome. So that's how we can get stuff inside of there. All right, last thing I want to show you all to get the information out of fave toys. Someone give me feather. How can I get feather out of here? Okay. Next one. Start off. Fave one. Fave one. Fave toys brackets. One. Bracket one. Or bracket one. one. Brackets. One. I think I heard all the pieces of the puzzle. All right, let's do it. Cat one. And our mount, our feather is saved in which property? That answer is fave toys. Fave toys. So what we need to say is, Cat one, I need your fave toys here. So we say Square fave bracket. toys. And then so we go, <laughs> one second. So if we ran this right now, what we get back is the full array. So we get back the full array right now. So if we want an individual piece out of the array, and I heard it a lot, square bracket, which you are absolutely correct. And then feather is at index one. So we run this and we get directly back feather. So this is how we can get something out of an array within an object. So take a step back and just look at this. We got information out of this cat object. We got the name and age, that's fun and stuff, but you just got it out of an array. You got feather out of array, which I know is just a feather, but that's a lot. We also got information of an object that's inside of an object. Objectception, I think that's the right way to say that. You just got information of an object within an object. And we can keep going on in here. I know this is a lot to take in right now, but remember you can keep building it inside of each other and more and more and more and within an object can become super complex. But wow. in the end, you know how to fulfill that address. All right, I heard a question. Kyle, I can't see the code. So for the object within an object, is it just double dot no Is it just cat one dot cat heart dot blah, whatever? Like is Absolutely, it just... yeah. So it's cat one dot heart dot is still kicking okay okay so it is double dot okay yep yeah we use dot notation to say inside this inside this inside this grab this information and then it gets returned awesome why isn't it a property within a property and not an and an object within an object you're calling it an object within an object but shouldn't it be a property within a property well technically the property is of what data type is of what data type? Um, Heart is of what data type? Heart's an object. Exactly right. Oh. Remember, are these curly brackets denote another object? So remember, this is oh. an object. So when oh. I say an object within an object, heart is another object. So okay. when I say oh. object inside okay. of object, you're also right too. We got grabbed a property that's within the side of property. Either way, we're kind of saying the same thing there. So if it works better with you by calling a property within a property, that's fine too. Just know that if you did a type of, and we'll do it real quick here, type of on cat1.heart, 
we'll go ahead and get back object there. Object. Okay. I can and real see quick, if we do this on name, just to promise that, we get back a string for name. Awesome. Would I hear another question out there? Yeah, I was about to say, I can see how I, I would think there's a property too, because after heart is uh, the colon instead of an equal sign, but I forgot about the the curly brackets, like makes there be another object. Is that is that basically the correct way? Yeah, yeah, you can think of it okay. that way. I mean, these curly brackets are just creating another object for heart. So heart now okay. stores an object. Gotcha. Cat one also stores that object. It's just an object within an object. So Kyle, to uh, print line 11 to the screen, will we do console log cat one that name that is still kicking? Talk me through it again. How would we do that? You said cat it's one. And then what's yep, next? That name. And then that is still kicking. So we run this. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, not heart. I'm uh, not not name. I'm sorry, heart. I'm sorry. All right. Heart. So I want to make sure heart. you're absolutely you. right. Then yes, <laughs> thank you. Heart. Absolutely yes. With that one, then we get back true because it is still kicking. So we use dots between each of those calls. Yep. Very good. Hi. All right, everyone. Yes, oh. Tina. Hi. Like uh, say that one more time. I think I was getting uh, feedback. If we say type of cat one dot heart, would it give back object? Yes, we saw that. So let me go ahead and do it one more time here. Yes, but if we do yeah, type yeah. of in front of there, type of, we run that, we'll get back object. Yep. So I've got a question. Yeah, Jody. If you put an object inside of an object, right? Does mm -hmm. the second object that's inside, if you were to not assign initial values, for, would it inherit values from the top object? Like would it, does there is there any type of inheritance going on there where you can nope remember all of our properties can keep their independence so okay. no they, that heart so if we you declare an empty object has no idea what the other properties are inside of it okay, or, uh, so that, uh, are related to it okay so you can't do inheritance type thing okay nope mm. uh i have a question since uh, heart is an object instead of colon can we use equal to the say, say that one more time Oh, where do you uh, want to be equal? Uh, since heart is an object, instead of colon, can we use equal to? Heart equal to? Remember, we can never use equal signs inside of objects, no matter what. Never, never, never to assign a property. Assign. To okay. assign a property, we only use what? Colon. 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 Only colon. use colons. Very good. Yes. So no. I see where your head's at, but no, no cheating. Always got to use a colon. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's keep going on. If there's any more questions, we can do them at the end, but we got a few more things we got to talk about here. So let's keep going. All right, so we have now really explored dot notation. That's how we can get information out of, excuse me, out of our objects. If we know the property name, but there's one more way we can do the exact same thing in just a little bit different of style. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So we're gonna get name back again. Okay, we've done dot notation, but let's talk about it one more time. So cat one here, and I wanna get out now the age. What I can use, kind of how we did with arrays, is bracket notation. Inside of the brackets, we can provide the property name we are looking for. So cat one, and inside those quotes, or inside those square brackets, we include a string, excuse me, with the property name we're looking for. So this is the property name with bracket notation. So again, this is doing the exact same thing. It's getting information out of our object. It's just styled in a different way. So let's go and take a look at that. And we wanna go ahead and console log cat one, and I wanna get the age out. I place age as a string inside those quotes. And I use the console log again, just to see the result here. We press run and we see seven still getting back that information. If I change this to name, we run this, and we still got back Nacho. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into the other examples that we talked about on the previous one. What if we wanna get back Feather again for this one, using bracket notation? 
Well, in that case, we'd say instead of name, we'd say fave toys where feathers is trapped at. We run this, we see we get back the array. Then the next thing we need to do is tell what part of the array we want to get it from. We want to get the first index after the zeroth index. We run this, we get back feather. One more thing, what if we want to get is kicking? Well, instead of fave toys, we say heart. And then inside of the next square bracket, we say is kicking. It's still kicking, excuse me. We run this, we get back true. This right here is how we can use bracket notation to get information out of our objects. Now, you might be asking yourself, between dot notation and bracket notation, which one should I choose? Great question. Typically, you're going to be using dot notation to get your properties out of your objects. So use dot notation most of the time. Bracket notation has its spot. Bracket notation is used when you want to do a more customized call to your object. I'm going to just show you that real quick. Say I have a variable, my props or something like that, or search this prop, and I want to say search heart or search fave toy, toys. What I can do now. I'm going to revert this because fave toys is the array. I'm going to put zero in there. Search this prop. Now I can include a variable inside of these square brackets here to go ahead and run that. And I now get back mouse. That is why we would use square brackets. Do more of a customizable approach to finding information inside of our objects. Now, why would you do this? What, what if instead you ask the user to maybe get a certain property out of, or like say, hey, what do you want to know about the cat? You ask the user and say, I want to know name. And they type in name. You can take that user input, pass it in here, and it gives them back the name. So that's what I mean by that customizable approach with the bracket notation. So I'm going to go ahead and let you guys unmute yourself now and fire away any questions you have about the bracket notation. Again, same exact concept as dot notation. It gets back information. Just do it in a different, a little bit different way. So for your property names, can they be um, more than one word? With or without spaces? With, with spaces? No spaces. spaces. No spaces are spaces are dangerous in coding. Okay. Right, I that's know. That's why we. But what about your capitalize. But the values can be. Only if they're wrapped inside those quotes, which makes it a string. Okay. Inside these quotes means it's one thing. So you can put sentences in here, anything you want to do, but it has to be wrapped in those quotes. That's how JavaScript knows where to start and end your value. Awesome question. All right. Any other questions out there? Hey, Kyle. Uh, why yeah. couldn't we do, use dot notation here when using a variable, when we are assigning a variable here? Like search this prop, cat one dot search this prop. Mm -hmm. Can we use so, it like that? Oh, if I did it like dot notation like that? Yeah. No. So if we did this, it's going to say it has no idea what, you're, what we're talking about. It will say undefined because this right here is saying, I want you to search exactly for search my prop in the properties. Dot notation doesn't allow us to do this customizable thing. That's the difference between the two. So to answer your question, no, we're not able to do that. Because when we do dot notation, it's saying search for this explicitly inside of my object. So search this prop, it's going to go through like, okay, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, et cetera, and return undefined. So we're not so, able to do that. Is that Kyle, real, quick, real, 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 quick, real quick. So does that answer your question? Uh, but why does, why does this work for the bracket notation? Because bracket notation is taking other things into account. Remember, in bracket notation, we provide a string. What is the data type of search this prop? What is the data type of search this prop? String. It's a string, exactly. A string. So in bracket notation, we provide strings. Mm -hmm. Search this prop is actually fave toys. So again, if we kind of like use that our minds as the compiler, this is what the equivalence is. So when we run that, it will return us the array. 
So we're able to do that with bracket notation because bracket notation wants a string inside of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And I, Henry, I think I saw you, your, your picture pop up here. Did you have a question? Yeah, I, I was going to ask something before I saw that you defined search this prop. So never mind. Okay. No, no, no worries. Quick question. Yeah, John. So um, would it be like I when I actually saw uh, the object from JavaScript, I instinctively thought, oh, it's just like, using, like you know, we access like methods um, by dot notation. So I was thinking like, oh, if it, if, it, if it has a function, if it's a method, then like using dot notation. And if you're going to just access a value, then I thought like just using a bracket, would that be like, is that a right practice? Then like, would you consider or? I, I guess, I'm sorry, I was, I was trying to follow there. So, um, okay, so you use dot notation and then w for properties and yeah, then Because we usually use dot notation for like, I mean, so far, like as like, as a, as a method, when it has a method and I, for me personally, um, I would, I would use dot notation if it has like a method or function, mm -hmm. right? But um, for bracket, I was thinking, oh, if it just has a value, like a property or like a single value, and then I was thinking, oh, uh, now I'll just use a bracket, like just just, just because I, like I come from like a like a dictionary, like hash table, so like you know how they you all, all just have like a brackets and and access the values. So I was thinking like, oh, if it's a value, then then I'll just use bracket. If it's a function, then I'll just use a dot. Like, is that a bad way to go about it? Only use bracket notation if you have to. The recommended way is dot notation. Dot notation? Right. Yeah. If you cool. know what property you want, if you know what property you want, use dot notation. Dot length, dot name. If you know what you want, use dot notation. Don't make JavaScript second guess. That's when it gets dangerous. Is that the, it's a more efficient way, basically? that the dot notation you're using an identifier directly. And so bracket notation, it has to parse that string and everything. And so it's less efficient unless you have to use the, unless it's a situation where it needs a bracket notation. Uh, if we're talking about optimization approach, it's gonna be a little bit of a speed up. It's more about safety. It's more about just having concrete code. You don't wanna have hard coded strings in your code if it is avoidable. That's why we use dot notation. So I have a quick question that might be obvious, but I'm a little confused. So on line 15, when you said that search this prop was going to be initialized to fave toys, I thought to myself, well, how does line 15 know that it can grab um, fave toys out of the object thing? Is it because of the let on cat one? So everything that's inside of that object, I can just randomly call, like I could say let you know, I'm happy, equal, is good, like I can call well, anything? We're talking about 15 here. 15 is just an innocent bystanding variable. It had plays no part in this. It's just saying, I am fave toys, that is my purpose. That is it. 15 plays no role in getting anything out of the object. Okay, because I was really confused. Okay. okay, no, we abuse that innocent bystander inside of this call here, when we unplug the variable inside of those brackets. Now, Again, the innocent variable who says, I'm just fave toys is being used down here inside those brackets to say, okay, I want fave toys from cat one. So we're utilizing the variable on 15, but 15 plays no part in the actual call itself. So if I say fave toy with a few exclamation points right here and I run that, I'm going to get back undefined again because it has no idea what fave toys exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point is. So hopefully that didn't confuse any further, but does that kind of offer some kind of clarity? It kind of does. It's just interesting. I didn't think that like, because it's inside of the object curly brackets, I thought that it could only live inside of the object. Who's inside the curly brackets? Fave toys. It is inside the curly brackets, but this isn't a function or an if statement or a for loop. So it, it's not used like a tool. It, this is a container. So remember, is information, okay. still is information still accessible in an array after it's been initialized inside those square yeah. brackets? Same with objects. It's just a container. Awesome, awesome. All right, I see one question from Jeff, and then we'll got to keep going here. Is bracket syntax more flexible than dot notation? It is, Jeff. Yes, as we just saw, we can plug in variables in bracket notation. We cannot do that with dot notation. Square brackets should also only be used, though, because they are very powerful, only when necessary. Only when necessary. 
Uh, Rena, objects do not technically have a length. Arrays have length. Objects have properties. So those property names. Now what I'm getting at is that we can count those property names, which can kind of be a length, but it's more of a size. It's how many property values do they have, which isn't usually really useful to us too much. But if you want to think of it as a name, it's never a length. So objects do not have a length. They have just a number or amount of properties. And then I see, just sorry, I skipped over one of this. Can the variable search this prop be turned into an array and still work the same? It cannot, because once we turn this from a string into an array, our bracket notation is gonna get very confused. Well, no, JavaScript is just gonna really just not work with me here. Do not turn it into an array, keep it as a string. Do not do that. JavaScript is just trying to be nice, but it is going to let you down in the future. Keep it as a string. Just to double check on line 17, there's an extra bracket in there, right? I don't believe so. We have, I think we have, yeah, open and then close square bracket there. And then we have two parentheses wrapping it from the console log. You're seeing okay. the same thing? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's okay. I, there, I can kind Smaller, of... small, thank you. <laughs> well, maybe it might be like this for the rest of the class now. I can't zoom out, there we go. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, I'll do one more question. It, key and property name is the same. Yes, Jasmine, key is, this, is synonymous to property name. So if we look at this, this is called a key sometimes, and this is the value. Keys and property names, again, must stay unique. Must stay unique. How do we get the key value from cat one? As we saw how we get the value how we get the get value for a key is that we use the key to unlock it. What do I mean by that? As we just learned, the property name is the key. We use the key, which is age here, or name or whatever, to unlock the value. We run this and we unlock the value. That's another way to talk about it. Th that terminology is also commonly used. All right, we are gonna keep on going here. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end, but I wanna keep us on time. Luckily, I think the next example, we've already kind of walked through quite a bit. So we're going to talk about, all right, kitty cat, what's your favorite, number one favorite toy? So we've already seen this. We got to get our favorite toys from our cat variable. We've seen that here. We're going to start with cat one. We're going to say fave toys. And then what do I need to include on the end here? You already know this. An index. An index. And the favorite toys going to be at the zero with index for this one. So we say square bracket. So we say square bracket, zero, just like that. Awesome. All right, that's how we get information out of an array that's locked away inside of our object. Let's talk about one more thing just to upset you at the end of class. We're gonna bring back in that cat one or, uh, object right there. We have our name, age, fave toys, is good, true. Look at this very closely. We're gonna do a quick test here. Promise I won't grade it. Nacho is a string, seven is an age. Favorite toys is an array, is good as a true. We have four data types. We have strings, numbers, arrays, booleans. What's another one that we don't have here? Probably functions. Function. I, that was like the most like let down, I was like probably functions. He's probably gonna somehow mess us over by using functions. You're absolutely right, let's talk about it. I want this cat to meow, just like we all did in the beginning of class here, meow. And now we're going to build a function inside of our object. How we do that is we provide exactly what we just said. We build that function. Let's take a very close look at this kind of function. What is this thing called? An anonymous, anonymous function. function. An anonymous, anonymous function. function. Very good anonymous function because it doesn't have a name. Remember our named function goes function, the name of the function, parentheses. Anonymous functions go function, no name at all, parentheses, tell it what to do. That's an anonymous function right there. So what we're gonna do here is just gonna go ahead and say meow, say function, open and close parentheses. Remember, we can always add parameters in here if we wanted to or something like that. Oh, why do I have a red line right there? Anybody can tell me why I type this in? You're missing a comma. I sure am, very good, brownie points for you. Yeah. We were missing a comma there. Now that red is gone, awesome. So now I wanna go ahead and meow. What I'm gonna do is type in cat1.meow. Now if I ran this, what's gonna happen? 
Is anything going to happen? Parentheses. Yeah, nothing's going to happen because we created the function, but we need to call it using the parentheses. We run this again now, and we see meow. Awesome. Look at that. If a meow ever blew your mind, it should be right now. That's how we create a function within a cat. Any questions on that? And you've seen this before. But I'm going to pause here before I go more into that. But any other questions? Is there a way to make the function somewhere else and then send it to meow, make it outside of the object? OK, I heard the first part. We can do that. Oh, you, um, so you're saying write a function and then put it into the cat? Exactly, yeah. Yes, we can. So if we wanted to technically, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you wanted to do that, my meow, and we can put it in like that. Would you not recommend this approach? But if you wanted to see how we did that, that would be it. So we run that, I believe, and we still have a meow there. But that's do you write the name? There is no parenthesis we don't need. This is, remember, the representation of my meow. We do not write the parentheses unless we want to call it. Right here, oh, we're just okay. saving the representation of the function into the property, meow. Oh. So the representation of it. Now, down here is where we use those parentheses to actually call it. Just like a variable, remember. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was just, but you're saying that's not good form, even though, even if it's like a really huge function, that's not a good form to make, make it outside of the object and then call it inside the object. It's not, that's not right to do. I understand where you're coming from. And yes, I could, it's a gray zone. It's all about human perspective. So what I can say is that I wouldn't like that, but another coder would be like, heck yeah. I would recommend <laughs> against doing that because if you have a giant function, it shouldn't mm -hmm. maybe be in an object. It should be somewhere else and other places we haven't really discussed yet. Okay. But um, essentially, if you have to, you can always do it this way. It's just not recommended. Usually if you have All functions right. within an object, it should be something smaller. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, it was like painful. It was like, oh, technically. All right. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. All right, this is functions in there. Let's keep going. Like I said, you've already seen this before. If your mind is blown right now, put that mind back in your head because you have seen this. I pinky promise. Console.log, that's one we've seen all the time. Console, it's technically a kind of object. We're calling dot log parentheses. Exactly what we just did with that meow. You've seen it before. See, I told you, I pinky promise and I kept my promise. But let's go ahead and keep going on other types of objects that we have not explored too much just yet. Well, actually, sorry, this one, I forgot about this example. We have seen more. We've seen the console.logs. You've also seen this one. Const input equals require read line sync. This input here, you're getting back an object with a bunch of functions in it and properties. You've seen this before too, because if we use input.question there, you're just calling it with dot notation to ask the user a question and return you back a value, whatever they typed in. So you've seen it before, a console log, this input dot question. You have done this. Now we're just seeing how they actually did it, how they actually made it. So let's go ahead and explore one more object, my nemesis math. We're going to explore exactly what this thing does. It is very useful because unfortunately, Math is a big portion of programming or just daily life when we're actually creating an application for something. So luckily, because JavaScript knows that we don't really like math too much, it created an object with a bunch of functions and properties within it as well to help us. Even better, they package this math object up natively. It, it comes with JavaScript unwrapped right then there. It's like batteries included, math is included. So we're able to have this inside of the code without having to do any of those extra little requires. So cool. Let's go ahead and see it in action. Let's bring in our first method or function to work with. We're gonna do the minimum function, math.min one, two, and three. We go over here, let's go ahead and see that. Okay, for up it wants to work with me. So we're gonna say const answer equals math.min one, two, three. Who can tell me what the minimum of one, two, and three is? One. Very good. We're going to get a map meow in here, but you know, I'll just keep the meow in there because it's funny. And look at that. One is the answer. 
So math.min finds us the minimum amount of uh, mount there, uh, excuse me, finds the minimum value from just provided parameters. So, so one, that, two, and three. Yeah, oh, Henry. Never mind. It, the, the way your cursor was, it was blocking out the actual code because it said like the message thing, but you moved it, so it's all good. No, no, no worries. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so we just do one, two, and three in there. Now, if you do max, you can do also max in here. That's another one we can introduce real quick. It'll return three. It'll return the maximum of those values provided. So we'll pause there just for a moment because I do want to introduce us to one more thing here. And that is the notorious math.random number. Let's go ahead and talk about this one. Oh, real quick. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about this. Math.random. We're going to go and type it in here. I'm going to say math.random. Remember, I just, not ransom, oh geez, random, oh gosh, random, perfect, there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and just comment out our answer up there. What this is, oh my gosh, I cannot spell that at all. There we go, run that. And we're gonna get back to this giant decimal number. This big old thing is actually gonna be about 14 digits, I think, technically 64 bit precision. 14 just decimals going out there. And if we keep running this, every time we run it, it will actually be something different. So this thing, though it's very weird and like giving us kind of nothing really, can be used for a lot of good things. And for instance, a random number generator, which is something we'll be discussing tonight in studio. To show that very briefly, what we can do is utilize the power of this giant decimal to give us a random number every single time. So real quick, what that is to help us out, because I'm, we're going to discuss it a little bit, is that we need to do a math.random. Now remember, this is a decimal, so we got to do a couple things to it. So I'm going to say, without returning there, const random. So what I want to do is I want to take this math.random. And I'm going to console log it out here below, just like that. All right, going to console log one more time. We should see that decimal once again, and that meow up there because the cat's got to the cat's got to talk. All right, now we want to transform this decimal into something again usable. I just want a random number between one and ten. That's it. Let's go ahead and do that. How can we transfer a, transform a decimal into something like that? Luckily, we have our hard. math stuff. Well, give me a second. It was rhetorical. It was rhetorical. We'll talk through it. <laughs> All right. I love the enthusiasm, though. Let's go ahead and transform it into a usable number. So what we need to first know is that we need to know the confines of the numbers we want to do. I said 1 in 10. So for this, someone very, very smart came up with our expression. What we do is multiply it by our min minus our, or excuse me, our max minus our min. And then we add back the min here. So what I said is I want my max to be my 10, my min to be one, and I add it by that. Now, if we run this again, we get back this, which is good, except that we need one more thing here, the math.floor. We run that, and now we actually get back our random numbers. Let me see, eight, five, Two. Nice. Looks like we are getting back all of our numbers and might be. Oh, no, that should be right. Yeah. The floor dot round. Any of the TAs on there? I always forget. It's in, I always get. I was, I was just about to ask isn't there multiple ways to do this? I mean, you could do floor. I did round, math dot round, math dot random times 10. Let me actually, I got it. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that actually more in studio. Okay, we'll go over that in studio. Wait, but, no, 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 zero it's, okay, it's okay. So, so yes, there are two ways you can do floor and, and round. However, the issue is, and, and I don't have it pulled up on here, and I don't remember all of my stuff. There is a bias if you use one or the other. You want to so, use floor. Thank you. you. That's what I thought. I was floor? like, you want to use floor because there is a bias introduced if you do round meaning it will usually be more tending to go to one side than the other if you do a round. I believe more in the upper numbers if you want to do that. So it'll round use, outside of your range. So one to 10 will give you like one to 11 and giving you half on one and 11. Something along those lines because it'll round it outside of what you're dealing with is the problem. 
Yeah, let really? me see if I can. Get, let me see if I can get one of those. I had to keep clicking run a thousand times to actually see it. But you could use a loop until I hit a. Are we doing? Until I hit, are we doing zero oh, to ten? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are we doing zero to ten? Run the number. Um, or, it was supposed what's to be the range? one to ten. One to ten. One to ten. Yeah. So I mean, if we were just doing zero, I was doing one to ten, so we didn't. So we actually couldn't include a minimum here. Um. So why does round create the bias though? Why, why? Right. So round creates the bias because if you, what was it? If you round, remember at five and up, you'll round up. At up, four, yeah. we disregard the decimal and we drop it. Your bias is introduced when you round up from 0.5 or higher. Okay, but then introducing that bias. But then doesn't floor create the same bias? Cause it just ignores five and up completely. And just no matter what the number is rounds down. Floor like, shows no bias to any decimal points. So therefore, no bias can be introduced. Oh, I Rounding see. Rounding does. I see. So, mm -hmm. so that's why that the, bias is introduced. The way I see it, I thought of it as like, the bias would be that like, it's like if you do math.random times 10 and then round that, then like every, you know, it's like, for the most part, it would even out, except at the edges where, like, the you would only get like, te you would only get like zero, you know, you would only round to zero if it was between, if it was between zero and point five. But then, what you can get a one on anywhere from point five to one point five. So you're just like any, and then it would be the vice versa like 10 right, would right. only be 9.5 and up that basically yeah, yeah. So, yeah no no i got you i got you so in the end there is a bias introduced just putting it out there but thank you sean for showing that yeah the random number tester do it that way use floor don't use round awesome yes thank you everybody for that this is like always a tricky thing because random number generators are always a fun thing just in general so no thank you very much raiden also for that all right um, I got to hop at over here and we got to do one more thing here. So just to really much elaborate, remember when it comes to objects, there are a bunch of them out there and this is how we call them with that dot notation. If you are ever curious about these objects that come with JavaScript, there is documentation out there for you to explore. So if you say math JavaScript library, if you are bored and need something to actually read or whatnot, Feel free to go to the documentation and see at all the math, uh, mathematical helper functions that they have for you to have fun with. Do not use this to cheat in math class. And that is basically it, everyone. We are all done here. Fantastic for today. As always, remember that there is studio review at seven o'clock. Um, feel free, or sorry, seven o'clock. Oh my gosh, eight o'clock. Feel free to join in if you'd like. Other than that, everyone, that is all I have for you today. Enjoy the studio tonight. It's going to be an extra fun one. And that is all I have for you all tonight. Again, awesome job. I will see you all back here, hopefully at 8 p.m. If not, have fun with Bree. And I will see you next Monday. Because by the way, we don't have class on Thursday. I won't be here to say that, but yeah. Okay. Wait, we don't have class next Thursday? Don't believe, oh no, I'm sorry. You don't have lecture, you don't have lecture. Wow, bad, bad final <laughs> message there. You don't have lecture, it is a catch-up day. So how does that work? Like what, what, I've never, how does it? A catch-up day is, I guess, hold on to your horses then, let's talk about it. And like, I'm gonna can double check that we do have our catch-up day because I believe it is that Thursday. Mm -hmm. That a catch-up day is when essentially it is a day for you to go into your small groups, work amongst each other or work on whatever you need to, to get caught up either on the material or on your assignments. And I believe that is going to be the first day. Um, usually we tell you the class before, but again, I won't be there. So let me double check here. That is Thursday. Yes, that is class 8.5. And we look at the syllabus. It's called catch up day number one. So, yep, you will be going to your small groups. You must need to still go to your small groups in order for attendance to be accounted, but there just won't be me yelling in your face on Thursday. So that is it. Thank you, Karen. Right. Absolutely. Thanks,